So uh, just like to credit as I get going, um, the work that I'm presenting is, is some work that I've been involved with a number of years and started off with uh, working with Deb Clark and uh, some other tri-agency personnel. Um, and Teresa Saunders, who's one of the co-authors, uh, gathered both samples and the genomic data that I'll present today as part of her master's work here at BYU and uh, make sure that she gets the recognition for her contributions to the work that I'm going to present today. And she's pursuing a PhD now at Washington State University and is, is doing good things. And uh, Mark Porter has long worked with Alice Yella. He just recently retired from Rancho Santa Ana Botanic Garden and, and he had his fingers in this also. So I, I presented this before when I've talked about Alice Yella with some of the preliminary data that we had, but just uh, because the species I'm presenting uh, that belong in the genus Alicella um, appear in the Utah floor in the genus Gilia. I always like to just do my little taxonomic lecture and, and make sure that we understand the differences between these two genera because there are a number of differences. And uh, within Polymoniaceae, Gilia uh, resides in a tribe Gilii that is sister and related with Alophilum, Clomi, and Navaretias where Aliciella belongs in a tribe Lois Elii that is closely related to Eriastrum and Ipmopsis, Lois Eliastrum, Lois Elia, and, and some other species. So there's quite a bit of, of differentiation between these two uh, tribes and also between these two genera. All of the members of Gilia, if you place them in, in water, if you place their seeds in water, then they quickly imbibe water and little sphericals, little coiled up hairs that are in the epidermal layer will exude forth uh, from those cells and provide some mucilage, uh, which tends to stick to things and may be helpful in dispersal. Uh, the genus Aliciella, if you place their seeds in water, they will eventually imbibe water and, and cause the embryo to lead dormancy and start to germinate, but they'll, they don't have the sphericals in that epidermal layer. They'll never exude mucilage. And you can also see that they're pretty nicely winged around the margin. At a higher levels of magnification, Gilia uh, has these little teeny bumps on the epidermis, but it doesn't have any of these larger warts or verrucci that you see in Aliciella. And at slightly lower levels of magnification, um, you can clearly see individual cells in the epidermis of the sea coats on Aliciella. There's always a border around. You can see the anticlinal uh, wall divisions there in any of the species, whereas in Gilia, those are completely masked and, and hidden. You don't see uh, where one cell stops and the next cell uh, begins in just looking at the epidermis. At kind of a larger level of of macromorphology, the glands on Gilia tend to darken, and that's because they have chloroplasts and cytoplasmic contents there in the glandular cells at the tip of the stipitate glands, where in Aliciella, they lack chloroplasts and those cytoplasmic contents. They don't darken, they, they stay gold. So if you see a dark gland on Aliciella, you really need to look again, and, and it's uh, really just a sand green that's going to be attached to the sticky gland rather than the gland itself being darkened. And then uh, one of my favorite features, just because it's useful in the field from a distance, um, things in Trigilii, including gilias, when the corolla falls off of the flower, the style uh, falls off of the, of the, um, from the pistil at the same time. And so every once in a while, you might see a style retained on the fruit as it's enlarging in, in Gilii and the genus Gilia, um, but it's a rare event. Whereas in Aliciella, uh, the corolla falls off and the styles mostly remain attached. And that's true for all of the things in a tribe, Lois Elii, Eriastrums do that, Ipomopsis does that. So it's really kind of a tribal level uh, morphological difference that that you key in on, on the differences between Gilius and Aliciella. So that brings me to Aliciella and not just section subnuda, but subsection subnuda. Um, Aliciellas are annual uh, and perennial biennial species. Uh, Gilias are all annual and the species I'm gonna be speaking about today are the uh, biennial and perennial species of subsection subnuda, which include these 
of six species. All of them have larger corollas that are quite showy, uh, attract pollinators, and uh, there are also a number of very narrow endemic species uh, in this group, as well as uh, Alicella subnuda, which has a considerable geographic range. Um, but all of them kind of restricted to the Colorado Plateau uh, region in the four corners in, here in the Western United States. So some of the earlier work that we did uh, molecularly was just to sequence the nuclear ITS region, which is commonly used at species level uh, systematics in plants, and then chloroplast genes, which are also useful at the species level, depending on what genes we're looking at. And we had sequenced three chloroplast genes. Uh, we added a lot more populations and species diversity to that initial uh, work that we did. But what we have is, is some conflict between what is resolved with the nuclear ITS region versus what we see in the chloroplast. And uh, one example, if we look at these species, Formosa, Haydenii, and Cliffordii, that uh, have maybe a stray nucleotide here or there that differentiates, uh, or that we'll see in one sample or another, we really can't distinguish those three species from each other with this ITS region. Um, but if we look at the chloroplast, we see that uh, there's some differences here. Haydenii actually forms two groups. Each one of these little lines on the phylogeny is representing a mutational event. So there's some Haydenii that's very different in the chloroplast from other Haydenii that actually look like maybe they have captured the chloroplast of Aliciella formosa. And then Aliciella cliffordii, which we can't distinguish at all with ITS, actually appears up here with these uh, lighter blue haplotypes, which all belong to Aliciella subnuda, suggesting some chloroplast capture there and uh, additional instances of chloroplast capture I'll talk a little bit more about here in just a minute. But the, this appears from just looking at ITS versus the chloroplast, that, that chloroplast capture appears to be pretty widespread in this group, which is kind of interesting given their uh, geographic ranges and, and uh, their small uh, sizes, and again, some narrow endemism in, in some of the species. So, um, really quickly, uh, our review of, of genetics and chloroplast capture, if we have two species that hybridize with each other and that hybrid is fertile and it continues to back cross in one direction with one of those parents, after eight generations of back crossing, we would end up with the offspring that morphologically looks like the uh, pollen donor parent and for all intents and purposes, its, it's nuclear genome is 99.61% is now the same as, as the pollen donor parent, but it has the chloroplast that came from the, the pistolate parent. And that's what chloroplast capture is. It's just something that we would expect to see when you have hybridization followed by repeating back crossing to, in, to one of the parents. So this gives us a couple of hypotheses to work with. And uh, the first is just that even though it's not very resolved, the nuclear ITS region is tracking the species boundaries accurately, which would mean that the differences that we see between ITS and the chloroplast DNA is the result of a chloroplast DNA capture. Um, but the other hypothesis alternative would be that the nuclear ITS isn't tracking the species boundaries accurately. And that it's actually the chloroplast DNA that's better reflecting species boundaries and the ITS is compromised by gene conversion. So without going into a lot of detail, um, organisms have thousands of copies of the ITS because ribos ribosomes are so important for life. And uh, one of those copies of the ribosomal cistron is used as a proofreader to go across all of the other thousands of copies and kind of keep them in check, keep them the way that they should be. But if that proofreader gets a cop, uh, mutation in it, then it really quickly spreads that mutation across all of the thousands of copies that are there. And so this process of gene conversion is a mechanism that can happen with ITS where a, a couple of mutations could um, uh, be spread across the genome. And, and every once in a while, you find out that ITS doesn't really match what the rest of the genome is, is saying. 
So we wanted to more broadly survey the nuclear genome. We wanted to sample throughout the nuclear genome and get a better idea. Is ITS really showing us what the nuclear genome is saying? Or is there some combination between because of hybridization or, or just what's going on with that? And we started off by sequencing just kind of fishing one gene at a time with uh, low copy nuclear genes and not finding uh, enough variation to do anything with it systematically. So we moved to an approach using a genomic kind of shotgun sequencing, which is called RADSeq, where the DNA is cut up into little pieces. Um, there are, uh, to enable the sequencing, there's some uh, tags placed on the end, and then kind of randomly throughout the entire genome, uh, portions of the genome are sequenced. And then you align homologous fragments from these kind of random sampling of the nuclear genome and look for variation, just little point mutations or whatever among those samples and, and see what that can tell you. Um, so that's what, what the approach that we took um, based on earlier collections that I had and then the field work that Teresa did in 2018. Uh, we had 179 individuals from 48 populations sampled. We tried to get at least four individuals per population. And then after we got the RADSeq data back um, from Florigenics, which did that work for us, we looked, uh, did some filtering for quality and coverage. We ended up with 119 individuals and 43 populations that we could pursue our, our data analysis with. And then these are a variety of the different analyses that Teresa did with her uh, master's thesis work and have a paper that's, that is nearly ready to be resubmitted um, detailing uh, these data. And uh, Teresa could tell you more about those analyses. I'm not gonna take time to explain those here. But this is the, the result of our genomic work. And uh, what I'd just point out is the orange arrows are highlighting species so this is the branch that supports Alicella formosa, and it's really highly supported and well differentiated. Uh, this is the branch leading to Alicella clifordii, the branch for Alicella haydenii. Um, these two species are actually on herbarium sheets, can be hard to tell apart. Um, alive in nature, you can distinguish them on, on flower color, but on herbarium sheets, they can be hard. So, so seeing that close relationship isn't a surprise, and it's, it's actually just what we'd expect. Alicella subnuta, cespitosa, and then a, a really strong branch here, uniting Alicella tenuous, including uh, all those populations that um, have been considered to be Gilia carini that occur a little bit farther north than what Alicella tenuous uh, was known from previously. Uh, over here, I just point this out really quickly. These are the results of structure analyses, which are to say, given the genetic variation we have, What's the, what does the genetics tell us about how many groups should be recognized? And uh, K equals four across the entire data set um, was kind of favored, which again, recognizes Alicella tenuous, Cespitosa subnuta. And then these three species just as a single group, if we actually broke it into uh, two groups with Alicella subnuta kind of as an out group down here, then those same structure analyses actually do recognize each of, each of these as separate species, the same as, as the clades that we're seeing. But in all of the structure analyses that we did, um, there was always strong support for Alicella tenuous, uh, including Gilia carini. So we would just synonymize Gilia carini with Alicella tenuous. We look at that just a little bit uh, closer. Again, Alicella. Clifordia is kind of the interesting species in, in what's going on with this lower part of the clade because Clifordii is, uh, again, morphologically similar to Haydenii, yet on the chloroplast topology, uh, we see that it actually shares a chloroplast with Alicella sub, subnuda. And so Haydenii, or part of Clifordii's origins, may have been um, through introgression. Of, of something near Haydenii with Alicella subnuda. And then again, we have this really strongly supported division between some of the Haydenii populations versus other Haydenii populations. Traditionally, there's been two subspecies recognized in Haydenii. And uh, in this uh, partially corresponds with that subspecies designation, although 
Uh, um, that's a rabbit hole I'm not going to go down into right now. We can talk more about that later. Um, so, and I can summarize that that here really quickly in my my one more minute. I might take a minute and a half. But uh, within within each one of these groups, the point that I wanted to make that was interesting to us was any structuring, which there is a lot of structuring within species, but that structuring has a really strong geographic component to it. So samples that are nearest each other geographically appear nearest to each other um, on the in our uh, phylogenetic trees. And uh, each one of the chloroplast types that we have for Alicea latinuus actually are, appear here as a clade. And uh, each one of those chloroplast types uh, then shows some geographic substructuring that could be very useful for management purposes. I don't feel like the evidence exists yet for us to um, want to take Alice latinuus and split it into multiple species or even subspecies at this point. But there's definitely very strong geographic cohesion between uh, what we see in, in the chloroplast haplotype trees and that is also reflected in that rad -seq data. And uh, that suggests to me that for management purposes with Alice latinuus, we ought to pay attention to those four groups, but it'd be very hard to have morphological features that we could use um, to recognize uh, any subspecies designations there. And uh, I'll leave this slide up here for 10 seconds, actually five seconds, you can read it. But the, the bottom line is that our RADSeq data reflects what ITS is telling us, which does suggest that the chloroplast uh, discordance is because of a chloroplast capture. And uh, then you can read through these other points later if you want to review the talk and that's posted on YouTube. And just the thing that Teresa wasn't able to do with her master's work that we wanted to do is to tie in the morphometrics with this. Um, we have some good morphological data from herbarium samples, but I'm not the kind of person who wants to look at one herbarium sheet. And we need more samples or even just out in the field of the photographs of the variation that we see within each of those chloroplast haplotypes for Alice L. Atenuous. Um, we have enough to know that uh, you really can't distinguish really Karenie from Alice L. Atenuous. But for the other haplotype groups, um, and we've just been in a drought since her thesis work started and the ability to get uh, especially flowers uh, for morphological work hasn't been available over the last few years. So thank you.